Every few years, the calls go out. Candidates wanted, of all types and stripes, to run for elected office, federally, provincially, and municipally. It's actually pretty remarkable when you think about it. Anyone who wants to put their name forward can, just like that, even though probably 90% of the people that do are going to lose. To take the plunge and try to get the job requires a ton of effort, <clears throat> sacrifice, and more. With us now on what's actually involved in running for office, let's welcome Todd McCarthy. He is the Progressive Conservative member for Durham. Amber Morley is here. She's Toronto City Councillor for Ward 3, Etobicoke Lakeshore. Chloe Brown, who ran for Mayor of Toronto in the last municipal election. And on the line, Sean McAuliffe, contributing columnist at the Toronto Star and co-founder of Spacing Magazine. And it's great to have you three first-timers here in our studio. And Sean, thanks for being there on the line from your place. I want to just, let's do some quick background here. Todd, you ran for Queen's Park for the first time in 2011. What happened? Well, I was uh, part of a team of PC candidates. Cut to uh, the chase. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> we had a wonderful campaign. Cut to the chase. What happened? And uh, I did not win the seat that year. What happened Steve? in 2014? Once again, I did not win the seat. <laughs> 2018, you didn't run. That's um, right. I, I was nominated, but I stepped aside to uh, continue to lead my law firm, Flaherty McCarthy, you were, and to you, do a lot of trials all over the province uh, that particular yeah. year. Jim Flaherty, Christine Elliott. Jim that's Flaherty, your law Christine firm. Elliott. Proud okay. to say that uh, I was uh, a member of the firm that they founded, and it now it was Flaherty Dow Elliott and McCarthy, and now it's Flaherty McCarthy LLP. Okay. 2022, you finally... Finally! You yes. blew through. <laughs> finally, that Steve, was the, yes. Now, yes. Th there might be some people who would say, uh, God is trying to tell me by two losses <laughs> and, a, and stepping out that I, this maybe is not the line of work for me. Why did you not come to that conclusion? Well, well first of all, you're talking to a litigation lawyer. So <laughs> we uh, we never stop fighting till the fight is done or won. There you go. Uh, and if at first you don't succeed, you appeal. Now, that's, mm -hmm. that's the trial courts. That's the appeal courts. Uh, you know, the truth of the matter is I believe in public service in all its forms. And I always was able to... Uh, gather a great team of volunteers and supporters. And when you have that kind of energy and that common cause, it just keeps you going. So when I was asked, I came back again. And But I'll tell you, Steve, it feels a lot better to win than you, the alternative. You don't say. <laughs> That's I right. believe it. Okay. Yeah. Were you successful the first time out I the gate? I not I know you the weren't. first time out the gate. What happened? Um, I finished with 10,985 votes. That number is seared into my mind. Which election I, was that? In 2018. Okay. That was the first time I ran, the first time I lost. For Toronto City Hall. For Toronto City Hall, for the seat that I now occupy. And why did you try again? I knew I could do it, and it needed to be done. So it, it, It's up. interesting you say that, because one of the absolute truisms of City Hall is that you can't beat an incumbent. And you did. I did. So I guess it's not a truism anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it doesn't make it any less true, but it makes your victory quite extraordinary. Thank you. Why do you think it happened? Um, a number of factors came to play in Etobicoke Lakeshore. I'm a lifelong resident. I've got deep roots and I've served the community there. I, I, along with Todd, I believe very deeply in public service. And um, so that's always been my uh, the type of work that I've occupied myself with. So I've got a lot of connections, a lot of networks. And frankly, the incumbent councillor had been in for 19 years. Mark um, Grimes. Mark Grimes was the incumbent councillor. And uh, uh, there was a very large appetite in the community for change. And I knew I could be uh, the kind of candidate that would bring the change that we needed. You referenced a few things there about money and networks, and we're going to mm -hmm. come back to that because that's quite important to our discussion mm -hmm. today. Chloe, God. you ran for mayor of Toronto last time. I did. And if memory serves, I don't know the exact number, as Amber <laughs> does of her vote, but I think you got something like 34,000 votes. I did. Which is not bad for first time out the gate. No. <laughs> Why'd you run for mayor? Um, I just don't like to be bullied, mm -hmm. and my stepfather taught me that, yeah, sometimes you got to take your licks, but sometimes you got to give them back, mm -hmm. and that's one of the ways that I've been involved in politics. Uh, I ran in 2016 against Michael Ford in the Ford machine. I ran against the Tory and the Tory machine in 2020, and it's just a way for me to remind regular citizens that you're a part of this process, the elected officials are regular people, and we are the checks and balances. You, you got 34,000 votes, which is a pretty good number for first time out. Thanks. John Tory got 340,000, so mm -hmm. you knew going into it you weren't going to win. Yes. Why'd you do it? Because courage isn't, courage isn't avoiding problems, it's going in knowing that you're licked and trying anyways. Mm -hmm. And growing up in Rexdale, I've Grown up with so many negative messages about who we are and the things that we stand for that 
I needed John Tory to know that that conversation was done. There's kids in Etobicoke, Scarborough, North York, and downtown Toronto that are worthy of being heard mm. outside of election seasons. And that's why I took that platform, because we deserved better than what we were getting. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, this is where we get the journalist in here to come in and now. And actually, you know what, Sean, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball here because you wrote a column a little while ago saying that you had actually thought about running for mayor of Toronto and had some people approach you about doing so, but ultimately you didn't do it. So let's explore that a little bit. Why did you want to run in the first place? Well, I did. I did a couple of degrees in political science, you know, in university. I always thought, you know, public service politics would be a natural thing to do. And then uh, in the last election uh, last summer, I was approached by one of those machines, you know, those uh, those kind of uh, people that will put together a campaign for you. Um, because I've sort of been a bit vocal, a vocal critic of Tory uh, in my column. Uh, not always a critic, though. Um, and so I thought about it for two weeks. And I realized the, um, the the commitment was beyond what I could, I think, pull off. I would have had to quit all my jobs. I'm a freelancer in everything I do, whether it's writing for the Star or teaching at University of Toronto. I would have had to quit all that with the, you know, a high risk of not winning. And then I would have had to start my life all over again, uh, you know, from scratch, sort of. Um, so I have so much admiration for people who who run, um, no matter what political stripe they are, because they put so much of their uh, personal life um, on the line. And it's not just the money part and the income and, and stopping your life. You suddenly open up your your life, your private life, to not just legitimate criticism, but an incredible amount of hate. That's the you know nature of. The, the sad nature of the way it is now. Um, and you have to have this kind of thick skin ag against that. And and I think I don't have it. And I really <laughs> admire people, uh, the people, you know, sitting on this panel who have it. Um, well, tell I, me this. I don't, know, I don't know where you got it from. Who, who, who approached you to run for Mayor of Toronto? I think they were kind of like a melange of center-left liberals. You, you want to put a name to it? No. Really. <laughs> well, you said it was a machine. Might... Like, what, what, what does uh, that mean? Uh, they were kind of, they're, they're people that work for um, sort of lobby groups and, and think tanks that will often take time off uh, during elections and go work on campaigns. So that's kind of how the machine, part of the machine works. People work uh, these sort of day jobs uh, with the knowledge that they'll jump onto a campaign. Um, and then they had some access to um, some political money, people who would back a mayor against John Tory, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, let's pursue this a little bit because this is, uh, and Amber, you raised this a moment ago, access to network, access to money, access to a machine, a lot of people think without that, you can't be successful. Todd, obviously, you had a political party behind you, you had a fundraising apparatus behind you, uh, you know, you had a leader who was obviously quite concerned that you win, so you had all that going for you. What machine was backing you? I built my machine. Uh, my community was my machine. Uh, my community has shown up for me in incredible ways over the years, encouraged me, you know, in my political aspirations in terms of advocacy and, and organizing. But it's a coalition of, of groups, I presume, yes? Um, yeah, I mean... So who's in that coalition? So I, when I first decided I was going to run, I br brought together about 20 of my closest personal friends, mentors, and, you know, um, colleagues, professional colleagues, to say, I'm thinking about this crazy thing, and what do you all think about this? Would you support me through this endeavor? Um, and they were all very, you know, um, supportive and, and um, enthusiastic about me taking this on. And so just knowing they had my back, it gave me the confidence to go forward, to continue to draw on and mobilize the networks that I had already been building since I was a teenager in my community through doing organizing. I had been um, pulling together all candidates' debates and, you know, mobilizing young people around trying to get a community center and space for ourselves to you know um, be able to do things other than hang out with idle hands uh, you know in the neighborhood um, and so yeah it really was an effort that took quite some time for me to identify um, who I could work with there was a group called women win Teal that was organized by former counselor current MPP Kristen Wong Tam uh, amongst many others um, including Velma Morgan who works with Operation Black Vote Canada was one of the founding members and um, they trained a, a group of about 20 young women who had political aspirations in 2017 to understand what it takes to run a winning campaign. So folks like Peggy Nash, other professionals and experts in the field came through and, and helped us understand what it took. I wonder if you had any of that behind you when you ran for mayor. No. 
<laughs> None of that. You had no. no coalition or machine or something. I'm a policy analyst. I eat policy for breakfast, <laughs> and that was my advantage. Um, I work at Toronto Metropolitan University right now, and I evaluate a variety of federally funded projects that are focused on the future of work. Mm -hmm. So it's like all I really had to do was bring the work table to the platform. Mm. And that was something that I thought was a lot easier than building a machine behind me because I am the machine. <laughs> <laughs> knowing, so, yeah. you, knowing you a little as I do, uh, I can confirm that. <laughs> you are the machine. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay, ta uh, again, you're a little different in as much as you did have this apparatus behind you. But, but let's approach it from this standpoint. You can't just decide I'm going to be the candidate for the progressive conservatives in such and such a riding, and therefore it happens. You actually have to earn the right to be the PC standard bearer. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Talk to us about networks, money, access to people, organization, all that. Well, I prefer to call all those things relationships, Steve. Okay. Life is about relationships. Politics is about relationships. And governing is about relationships. And it's, it's listening more than talking. Uh, now, what I did run for and win a seat on the school board in 1994 in Durham, um, and so I definitely can relate to uh, Chloe and Amber about that endeavor because, of course, you're not affiliated with a party, mm -hmm. so you do, you do have to put together your own team. Then when you run provincially or federally, as I have, of course, you're part of a team with the leader as, as leading that team and leading the message. And your job is, as Jim Flaherty taught me, to be part of that team because politics is a team sport at the provincial and federal level. Did you run and, federally as well? And I, I did. I, I did run federally in 2019. Run? Yes. So, so you lost that a, one too. Yeah. Okay. So, but Steve, <laughs> I, I, bat, I, I As I said on election night, when I won you know, on June 2nd, I'm batting 400, which mm. isn't bad in baseball. So five elections, two wins. That's batting 400. <laughs> that's not okay. bad. Yeah, you, that's you, not bad. You and that's Ted Williams, bad. Yeah. pretty good. Okay, that's all right. So, but you know, Premier Ford had a message that he delivered. Sent the five priorities of our campaign, and then our job is to make sure we deliver that message locally. One of the reasons and, people yeah. don't run, Todd, is yes. that they think they can't afford to do so. Right. So tell us this and be as specific as you can. How much money do you have to raise in order to mount an effective competitive campaign for the provincial legislature? Well, the, the great news in, in Canada is that when you run provincially or federally, you know, $100,000 raised for the writ period will allow you to be a very well-funded campaign. There won't be anything that you can't do in terms of office space, brochures, social media, signs. Um, all of those things are possible. And But bearing in mind, I mean, if you were running for a similar position for state legislature or Congress in the United States, you'd need seven-figure money. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, and whereas here we have, of course, um, when you're part of a team, your, your job is to, to raise money for your own local riding association and campaign, but also for the central party because you're part of that team and you benefit from the central message and you benefit from how that's messaged and conveyed by the leader in our case, well, it's two Premier street. Ford. If you yes. got a good leader, it's a benefit. If you got that's a turkey right. as a leader, you're going to get dragged down by there, that. There, there, well, there are always the safe seats for a particular party, mm -hmm. but definitely the, the leader is very, very important to your success yeah. for sure. Let's, yes. uh, Amber, let's talk money. How mm -hmm. much did you have to raise in order to mount a competitive campaign? Um, the first time out, we raised around fifty thousand. Um, Where did you get it from? Um, community members, family, friends, um, like in, and in, in mostly small donations. Like what size? Uh, Two fifty was the average donation. Two hundred fifty dollars. Um, yep, in both my campaigns, uh, we had folks initially that were hyper local, and then as our campaign grew, uh, as they do, right over time, as you get closer to election day, uh, we started having progressives across the whole city of Toronto who wanted to see more voices like mine at the around the table and so folks came out from the woodworks um yeah. i had the support of an organization called progress toronto um which uh did and they a gave lot you of, some money they didn't give me money but they um championed my campaign in some ways as a third party advertiser yeah. and uh, they were able to help to bring some support and you know donations and that kind of thing forward from the progressive community so and, in uh, 50 grand the year you lost how about the year you won would you raise I, I think we got closer to 60 65 and actually we're giving some money back to the city huh. of Toronto. Um, we were very mindful uh, and very fiscally responsible with our finances. Also, you know, growing up with a, not a lot, you learn to do a lot with a little. So, gotcha. Now, uh, I think John Tory raised $2 million when he ran for mayor. How, <laughs> how close did you get to that? Not even close. Um, <laughs> I put aside one paycheck 
Uh, because I work in nonprofit government services, you're used to just having small budgets mm-hmm. and having to make <laughs> miracles out of them. So that's what I did. I just, I just continued my day job, <laughs> to be honest. And did, I, you, did you raise money though? After the debates, I raised like four thousand dollars. Who'd you get to give you that money? Just people who really love the debates. <laughs> really? They saw yeah. you and they decided to contribute. Yes, and that's that was the problem. Like all of us thought John Tory was too big to fail and then those debates changed people's minds. And this is where like I leverage traditional media, social media to get my message out as opposed to spending dollars on it because social media is free. Mm-hmm. So, it was one of those things where it's like I knew I wasn't going to win, but I knew I had to make an impact. So it's like, how do you stretch $2,000 to reach as many people as possible? And that's having a good message that resonates with your audience. And that's what I did. And let's remind people, you I mean, Tori won, obviously. Gil Penalosa came second. You came third. Yeah. <laughs> Having never run for mayor before, you came third. Yeah. You defeated, I don't know what, like 40 other people? For... <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway, there's a lot of people who ran, and yeah. you came ahead of all of them. Here's Sean writing in uh, the Toronto Star last September. There's a reason politics is becoming a rich person's game, and that's bad for democracy, too. If you live in Toronto, your mayor, premier, and prime minister are all of inherited wealth greater than most Canadians will ever know. Regardless of their politics, anybody who isn't rich and decides to run for any office is making tremendous personal sacrifices deserving of respect. Sean, I want to pursue that with you. Do you really believe you have to be wealthy to win? Uh, I believe it happens a lot. Um, obviously, one of our panelists here um, shows that it, it is possible to be a regular person um, and win. Um, but when you just look across the, the landscape, there's so many, you know, relatively comfortable, wealthy people that ran um, that that lose that that can't that can't kind of mount that sustained campaign. Like before, John Tory was was mayor. He was uh, for a few years. He was the drive time host on one of the AM stations in Toronto, uh, which is sort of like. Uh, uh, I guess it's a full-time gig, uh, but maybe not for someone of, of John Tory's stature. But he had the ability to kind of do that gig to um, to get his name out there and, and kind of become this this fixture in people's lives. Well, that's a well-paying and gig, though, Sean. That that morning and afternoon radio are well-paying gigs. Not the rest of the day, but but he would have made a living doing sure. that. <laughs> Seriously, here, do, do you feel we're at a point right now where if you don't have a great deal of wealth, you can't run and win? I worry about that, you know, and I worry because because of the, uh, the 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 personal toll it takes on people. When I wrote my last book, Frontier City, I went for walks with uh, underdog candidates running for city council, um, and most of them had their own self-made machines, um, uh, like Amber was talking about, uh, community members, not that much money, and most of the people I walked with lost. Uh, it was the incumbents that won. It was some of the kind of wealthier campaigns, um, and there are there's lots of anomalies across. You know, when you when the, when the the little person and wins um, but um, I think it's something we should we should really think about and watch and 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 and, and see if if it is going in that direction Todd uh, I'll get you to weigh in on this because I mean we have had bears in Toronto who have not been people of immense wealth now as it happens right now Justin Trudeau Doug Ford John Tory uh, all did have ample resources uh, at their disposal to run do you think we're at a point where if you don't have money, you can't expect to win? I, I think the opposite, actually. I think uh, we, we can be proud in Canada that at all levels of government, we have people from all walks of life and um, different um, financial brackets who can and will be successful. And money in terms of campaigns doesn't play the role that it does in the United States because only personal donations are allowed. And there's a cap on any one donation. And there's a cap on spending. And I, I'm, I think we can all be very, very proud of that. We, well, we have okay. a very gotta, accessible system. i got to push back a little bit on that. All right. I mean, Doug Ford had a big event for 4,000 people the other day at the Toronto Congress Centre and raised a, I believe the technical term is, piss pot full of money at that event. 3500 bucks a ticket, I think. So, no, no, uh, wow. it was $1,500. $1,500, sorry. It was $1,500 a ticket. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that our party, the, the PC party, raises small amounts from many, many people. But not that night. And, and well, that, that was an event that was a province, a, 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 a provincial-centric approach. Everyone from all over the province of Ontario was represented at that event in Toronto. Uh, but for the most part, and, and that's a, 
uh, you know, a, a post-election once a year type of event. For the most part, our party raises small amounts from large numbers of people. And so the $25 and uh, $50 donations mean the world to us and, um, and they're welcome. And that's what sustains our party and the messaging associated with it. I, I'll get you on this, to, but, but before I do, I, he's not wrong about that last part, you know. I mean, there are pretty strict fundraising limits in place that don't allow people I mean, we're so not like the United States, it's not funny. Mm -hmm. You know, no, you can't, as a rich person, uh, hand a check of $25 million to Todd McCarthy as you could to a senator, uh, you know, put someone running for the Senate in the United States. Right. Having said that, do you think we're at a point where if you don't have money, you don't have a chance? It's not that you don't have a chance, but the question of what you'll be able to do with your life after mm -hmm. is very big. One of the reasons that I've been considering my running in a by-election is because people have been warning me, like I could be blacklisted from policy work if I don't follow the procedures of, you know, the Canadian establishment. And this is where, like, to his point, yes, the average person can contribute to a political party, but a $1,500 $1, ticket is it's 90% of my rent. My rent is 1610. Mm -hmm. I could not pay for access to the premier if I wanted to because then I risk homelessness. And this is where I feel that political parties have done a disservice to everyday residents because it is pay for play when it comes to meeting your political representative. Well, okay, let me again. I, I don't think that's I don't bit. think yeah. that's true at Go all. Ahead, Todd. I don't think that's true at all. First of all, there were 4,000 people in the room, so you're you're not going to get much face time with the premier or any member. We 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 were really responsible for making sure that the people from our ridings were looked after by ourselves, right? I I obviously sat with my group of people and uh, and they enjoyed themselves very much. And and yes, there's lots of networking involved with that number of people in the room. You're not going to get access. And that's uh, a, that so, is he so that's right fair. about that. That is a once a year thing. Right. That that big dinner is a once a year fundraiser. Uh, the average you know, person can't even afford that once correct, a year. Correct. <laughs> No, that's right. But they yeah. do they have other opportunities to participate? Yeah, they do. They have $25 spaghetti dinners. And they, they also have the chance not to pay anything because we value our volunteers, Steve. You know, the great thing about the political process is it's time, talent, and treasure. And the, the great joy is that everybody gives in different ways. There's donors who may come to a dinner event, but they never knock on doors. They never seal envelopes or distribute literature. And then there's others who give hours and weeks at a time. And we're, and we're so honored to have them. They're, they're the ones who win the elections. Let's give Chloe a chance to come back on that. So time is a luxury. If you're working two to three jobs, what time do you actually have to be involved in party politics all year round? And that is a barrier. And this is something that I have been trying to inspire with my particular campaign. If you are willing to sacrifice two months to having your face seen and being put up for scrutiny, there's a lot of impact that you can make. And even after the election, it's like I've been connecting with people who want to who wanted to organize for me for 2026. That is something that I wouldn't have been able to get if I didn't risk putting myself up at the highest office and losing. And that's not something that everyone can afford to do. I'm only able to afford to do it because I'm a policy analyst, I'm making $66,000 a year, and I work from home. Mm -hmm. If those three things weren't in place, I wouldn't even be able to run as a working class person. And this is where working class needs to be redefined because there are working class people making $100,000 but they can't afford to take time off. And then you have people that don't make $100,000 and they don't even have the resources to get versed in the procedural language of elections. And those are two separate issues because yes, the average person can donate, but how much time do they actually get with their elected officials, a different story. Mm -hmm. Sean, let me get you in here at this point because uh, there are actually no minimum qualifications you need to have to run for mayor of Toronto, yeah. or any city for that matter. Uh, but clearly there's a skill set you need. What's part of that skill set in your view? Uh, you need to know how to make policy in a very messy situation. Um, in the first uh, few months of John Tory's um, 
tenure back in 2014, um, his team was pretty new, and it was kind of awkward to watch him run city council. Uh, he kind of it, it, it didn't work so smoothly. And then they got the machine uh, going um, really well. The team kind of figured out how how Toronto city council works. City councils in across Ontario are kind of interesting beasts, whereas federally and, and provincially, you know, policies made in caucus behind the scenes. It's really the sausage is made in front of us at city council. So for a lot of people, they see all the arguing and it's like, oh, it's so messy. Uh, but actually, that's kind of sometimes what it makes it interesting is you see the thing get made. And to negotiate that in real time with the cameras rolling and people watching um, can be a real challenge. So I think you you really learn on the job for that. That's why often a lot of councillors kind of go up into running for mayor because they know how this particular political beast works. Right. Well, okay, let me follow up on that. We've got about five minutes to go here, and, and, I, and I'm very interested in following up on Chloe's kind of, the bar to entry in her view is too high. Having said that, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. You know, I have heard people say, Sean, you might be one of them, actually, uh, who say something like, you know, I haven't run for anything before. I don't have a fundraising team in place. I don't have a coalition of groups or organizations that are, you know, that I've spent years putting together. I'm frustrated that I'm unable to mount a bid to run for mayor of the city uh, or run for premier, run for prime minister or whatever. And I guess my question is, is it reasonable for a candidate or a would-be candidate to feel that way? Do you not have to have done something in this field in order to have a reasonable shot to participate? You tell me. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, we have we have politicians who are lifelong politicians. Some of those lifelong politicians will rail against lifelong politicians. <laughs> um, that's the only real job they've had. You know, if you if you've if you've run your own business, if you've worked out in the world, uh, if you've been a pipe fitter, um, these are some of the voices that we never hear uh, or rarely hear about um, in our in our elected chambers. So yeah, living your life uh, in this place that we all hang out together um, is experience enough. Um, and then you got to learn on the job really quickly. Well, okay, Amber, I'll follow up with you. And again, this may be a ridiculous example, but I'm going to throw it out there just to be provocative for the heck of it. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody wants to be the anchor of the CBC National News. Mm -hmm. They never went to journalism school. Mm -hmm. uh, they have never worked for a newspaper or a radio station in the past. Uh, they've decided at the age of 40 that I think it might be interesting to go into journalism because I'm kind of interested in public affairs. And then they're shocked that when they go for an interview, the news director at CBC says, well, you kind of don't have any of the experience or you know, approach or attitude that you need to do this job. What makes you think you can be the anchor of the national? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if that's a good analogy, mm. but, but speak to me, if you would, about you know, sort of the bar for entry to being the mayor of Toronto. I mean, it's not yeah. an entry-level job. No, not at all. Um, but I think there's a lot of learning that happens, as Sean mentioned, right? You you kind of learn through being. And uh, times are changing now. Uh, we traditionally, you know, would see my mom's a baby boomer, right? She had one career, and that was it. Um, our generation is not, that's not what it is anymore. Um, and so folks are continuing to change their, their vocations and taking their, I think, trying their hand at different things that they might have interest in or skills around. Um, the only thing I guess I would say is I didn't have experience as a politician. Certainly, obviously, whoever does until you get elected. Um, I did work as a staffer for five years at City Hall. So, you know, I felt a high degree of confidence that I had the right approach and attitude to get the job done. Um, but my entire team uh, at City Hall now, we're, we're continuing to staff up and build the team out. But none of them are coming at this job with political experience or experience on the floor of council and I specifically selected them because I wanted folks who had the right kind of approach to the job uh, who are intelligent curious lifelong learners who had an excellent ability to take care of our residents and to you know um, dig into the work and learn on the job as Sean talked about because um, there's no training in this role you really learn by doing learn and by doing. some of us excel in that and Todd I guess I'll give you the last word here is uh, apropos of Chloe's point is the bar to entry to politics still too high? I don't think it is too high. I think actually th that's a myth. I mean, I met model parliamentarians, the students recently. They came to Queen's Park. I was honored to go to each table. And um, very idealistic young people, all different interests. And, and I encourage that. 
And a few of them said, well, you're a lawyer because we looked you up. Do you have to be a lawyer to be here? I said, absolutely not. Uh, and that, that's just a myth. The, the great thing is you, you only have to be 18 years of age and a citizen to put your name on a ballot municipally, federally, or provincially. Now, and, uh, am I going to look forward to seeing your name on a ballot for mayor uh, in the special by-election later in June? Yes. <laughs> You're going to run for mayor of Toronto again? Yeah. Okay. Um, I got four months to process my own data and develop tools for the community. And with three years, a lot can be done. So that's why I'm running, because democracy is not just about the mayor. It's about what the mayor can do for its people. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm really just focused on, like, how do I let people understand, like, this is not just about Chloe. It's about what Chloe can do for her community that has taken care of her. Well, having said that, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to put the breaking news <laughs> banner on the bottom there, because Chloe Brown just announced right here on the agenda she's running for mayor of Toronto. Okay, good. Uh, I want to thank all of our guests for uh, really a great discussion, uh, giving our viewers something, uh, a lot to think about, actually. Todd McCarthy, the PC member for Durham, and Chloe Brown, former and future mayoral candidate in the city of Toronto. <laughs> Amber Morley's over here on my right side, the Ward 3 Etobicoke Lakeshore City Councillor. Sean McAuliffe, Toronto Star, uh, writing. Uh, you can read his stuff in, uh, as we used to call it, the Toronto Daily Star. <laughs> great discussion, everybody. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.